Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, our webinar uh, from the FCC on the emergency alert system and wireless emergency alert system. My name is Rich Lerner. I'm with the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the FCC. Um, we, uh, our Office of Intergovernmental Affairs is an office that uh, hopes to uh, serve as a liaison between state and local government and the FCC. So this webinar is uh, being presented uh, for the intended audience uh, of state and local government officials. Uh, presenting today will be Greg Cook uh, from our Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Um, if you have any questions uh, during this webinar, the way to submit them is by emailing them to iga at fcc.gov. You should be able to see that email address on the bottom of every slide. So. Uh, Without uh, further ado, I will hand it over to Greg and uh, let him get started. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, everybody. This is, I'm really happy to be here because I think that it's very important for state, local, tribal, governmental officials to be aware of these systems, to understand them, and to see how they operate and where you are as, as a key stakeholder uh, in this process to keep your citizens safe. So, in any event, let's just talk a little bit about general stuff and then we'll get into the systems. Uh, oh, you know, why us? Uh, because it is promoting safety of life and property through the use of wire and radio is, is key to the FCC's missions. It's one of the reasons why we spend the time we do to ensure that these uh, alerting systems that are operated by the entities that we regulate are, are accurate and responsive to the needs of citizens. And this is consistent with U.S. national policy that uh, there would be an effective, reliable, integrated, flexible, comprehensive system to warn the American people uh, in situations of war, natural disaster, et cetera, and making sure that the president, under all circumstances, can communicate with the American people. Uh, what we're going to be concentrating on here today is not so much the presidential alert, but really your role. What is the role of the state, local, municipal, tribal, territorial government in ensuring that good uh, alerting information reaches the citizens? Um, so let's talk about the two systems that we um, that that we operate here. The first one is the emergency alert system, which is um, a national public alert and warning system, commonly used by state and local authorities. You can see it over your TV, over your radio. Delivers weather alerts. Delivers amber alerts. Uh, and these alerts are delivered on a voluntary basis, uh, as opposed to the presidential alert, which must be carried. There has never been a presidential alert. We test it pretty much once a year, but the president uh, has had sufficient uh, access to the public through news uh, and, 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 and through current broadcast not to require it to take over broadcast as we, as we know it. But boy, it's used all the time for tornado alerts, for amber alerts, for weather alerts. Uh, very common, and we all recognize it because of that eh, eh, eh sound that precedes the, uh, the EAS that is very recognizable. Uh, more recently, uh, the, emer the wireless emergency alert system has been launched, and that's been uh, in operation since about 2012. And that's the alert that you would get over your handset. And again, it makes a big loud noise and a big buzz, and it tells you when there's weather, tells you when there's an amber alert, and should the president ever... Um, uh, need to get through to the American people it would tell you would tell you that as well. Um, is there a way we can make this this thing go up so people can see the top of the slide? Short answer is yes. Sure. Short answer. Oh, there we go. Okay, fine. Want to make sure you get to see the whole slides. Let's take a look at what is the basic alerting model. And this is, we get through some of these complicated slides, just come back and think about this because this is how all alerts work. Alerts are generated by a trusted source. They are sent through communi commercial communications infrastructure, such as TV, radio, your wireless phones, and they get to the public. Now, who are the trust who's a trusted source? Um, well, the president is a trusted source. 
The National Weather Service is a trusted source. But you are a trusted source. State, local, county governments, emergency management agencies, your state police in many cases send out Amber Alerts. You guys are a trusted source who are in a unique position to deliver and make sure is delivered accurate alert and warning information to your citizens. So how do you become a trusted source? Well, part of that is going to be today. You're on this, taking this webinar. So you're going to get to learn the alerting systems that are available to you. But part of it is also training and using the systems that are out there. In a little bit, we're going to be talking about a system that is operated by FEMA called the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. It's an internet-based system that allows uh, alert initiators at the state, local, government, federal level to uh, generate alerts that are delivered to the public over multiple forums, whether it's the EAS through TV and radio, wireless emergency alerts through your, through your phones, but also through certain non-regulated uh, uh, systems that are available to state and local government, such as highway signs. And we've all seen amber alerts on highway signs, for example. So this is a, it's, it's a fantastic system. And, uh, but it takes, you got to be trained. So uh, there's your website, FEMA.gov, how to sign in. It will show you how the system works. Uh, it is something that you would have to get authorized to do. Um, absolutely get in touch with FEMA and, 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 and talk about that. One of the other things that we'll be talking about today is how EAS alerts are distributed locally, how local broadcasters are able to send messages to each other and in turn send them to the public. This is coordinated on the state and local level by entities called state emergency communication committees. And these often are your state broadcaster associations, as well as folks from the state emergency management agency work to come up with ways to ensure that if the internet, if the internet based uh, distribution systems are down, that broadcasters together can ensure that alerts are delivered to the public. We'll be getting into that in a little bit more detail later on. The way SECCs work is they submit something called a state EAS plan, which describe state and local EAS operations, contain guidelines, which must be followed to activate the EAS. For example, um, a lot of systems are automated. Cable is largely automated. Many TV and radio stations, particularly radio stations, might be running automated at night. And so if you're in, let's say, Moore, Oklahoma, and a tornado is coming through, you want to make sure that that tornado alert is delivered to the public. And the way that's done is by programming the EAS equipment to take certain types of alerts and make sure that they are delivered automatically. Uh, all these systems are designed to do that. Uh, they do it in many, many cases. One of the values of the state EAS plan, it says, in this state, here are the systems, here are the alerts that we want to be run automated. So if you're in Washington state, you'd have tsunamis necessarily have tornadoes. And as I said, in Oklahoma, you wouldn't have tsunamis, you'd have tornadoes. So this is all in the state plan. It's really important that state emergency managers and their uh, bosses, such as yourselves, familiarize themselves with these documents. Um, anyhow, that is the website, FCC.gov, going down to state EAS plans where you can review the state EAS plan for, for your state. Each state is listed there separately. And then if you want to get really good at this, you use the iPause Lab, which is an online test bed that allows you to initiate alerts, see how they work in different contexts, to become really good at this and comfortable with it so that when something actually happens, you're in a position to be able to just, you know, just do what you've, do what you've practiced and, and get that alert to the public. And then finally, uh, the National Weather Service does have local coordination meteorologists in every locality. Uh, these are the folks who would be responsible for initiating that weather alert that would ultimately come to you as an EAS alert. So they're folks that you need to find out who they are and, and get to know them because they're part of your community, they're part of your alerting community. Um, let's talk a little about emergency alerts. The lawyers, federal policy wonks among you, uh, the rules are in the Code of Federal, federal Regulations at 47 CFR 11.1, uh, and that just lays out the detail of the technical and the policy basis of the rules. So EAS participants are radio stations, television stations, cable providers, direct broadcast, Sirius XM, 
any of these folks are getting over the air, and they must deliver presidential alerts. They must deliver na nationwide monthly and weekly tests. But all other alerts, whether state, amber, are voluntary. Again, this is why the state plans are very valuable, because it allows the SECCs and the state emergency manager and other government entities to come up with sort of a mutual consensus on what's appropriate. What are the, what are the alerts that ought to be sent? Okay. So how, how, do, how does EAS get from you to the TV and the radio station? They are either delivered to EAS participants over the Internet through FEMA's Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS, or by over-the-air broadcast. And uh, EAS participants are required to monitor both systems for redundancy, but the big difference is that IPAWS, being an Internet-based system, uh, is a big data pipe. So it allows uh, 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 alerts to be offered that have digital sound, enhanced text, non-English alerts, multimedia such as photos, and URLs. So let's take a look about EAS distribution over iPods. This looks like a big complicated chart, but it is no different from the slide we showed a couple of slides ago. On the left, under alerting authorities, are your trusted sources. And you can see that local, state, territorial, tribal is right there. They are the top four, and then federal. Uh, then you have the uh, commercial communication structure, which is IPAWS open. Those are all the servers that are, that are, run, by I, that are run by FEMA to aggregate your alerts that are then disseminated uh, over the various systems by TV, by radio, by cell phones. Those are your alert disseminators. Uh, and then finally, to the people. And again, people listening to the TV or radio get EAS, handset wireless emergency alerts, and then other things that we don't regulate that come over, for example, a highway zone. The over-the-air distribution is older. Because it takes data over the air, there really isn't as much bandwidth to give all of the nice bells and whistles like digital sound and multilingual alerts that we can get over the internet. But the value that it has is that it's incredibly resilient. So if you're in a Hurricane Sandy situation where really everything is down but broadcast, this will work. This will work. And the way this works is that the trusted source here, it's, they, they we're looking at the FEMA Operations Center. This is uh, uh, a picture of a presidential alert, but it's, it's the same one. Uh, that, 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 that the state police, let's say, uh, initiating an AMBER alert, or any state entity that might be initiating some other kind of alert, would initiate it through equipment that would go to uh, one or two or more major radio stations in your state that would broadcast this alert. And when they broadcast this alert, you hear that very familiar EAS sound, that eh, eh, eh. Well, that's a little data burst. And under the state plan, there'll be other radio stations and TV stations that would be monitoring these major stations. And when their equipment hears that, two things happen. They, in turn, deliver that alert to the public. And they, in turn, also send out this, the, the alert with, the, with that sort of duck honk, which triggers the next level of equipment below it. So you might have, in a big state, hundreds of, of, of TV and radio stations. What the state plan does is it sets up a hierarchical structure for determining who has to monitor whom. And again, very simple, very resilient, something that state entities, emergency management agencies, state local government should be familiar with so that they know who to call. So that they know who to call when there is an actual alert or in the case of Hawaii, when there's a false alert that you may want to correct. And one of the issues with Hawaii was that there was a, these systems worked exactly as they were designed to work, but there was a 38-minute delay between the initial false alert and the, that went over EAS and WIA and the correction that went over EAS and WIA. The only reason there was a 38-minute delay was unfamiliarity with, with, with the folks, with the systems, and not rehearsing this. So I think that here... This is something that, that all state entities need to become at least superficially familiar with. So let's talk about recent happenings in the EAS world. I'll take the bottom bullet first. EAS plans are very important, as we have been discussing, but have traditionally, uh, up to this date, been submitted in paper, and they're kind of ungainly and hard to work with. Uh, in April, the Commission adopted rules creating a new a streamlined electronic system 
that will allow the SECCs to file these online using predetermined templates. What that's going to do is make it very easy to be updated. We'll come up with a consistent plan for the uh, plans to be, or a cons consistent method for plans to be reviewed and plans to be studied. And we'll also, in combination with the system we also have in place called the EAS test reporting system that all of the TV and radio stations use, will allow us to actually map the way alerts would be propagated across the state. So we're hoping that this will become a very efficient and easy tool for state and local managers and emergency managers to use to ensure that they know exactly how EAS works within their state. Um, EAS uses codes, tornado codes, uh, uh, hurricane codes to define particular alerts. Uh, last year, the commission adopted one that uh, was mandated by law enforcement uh, by, by Congress in the Blue Alert Act that the Commission adopted a code they called the BLU code, which is for blue alerts. Um, and uh, what, that, what that will do is will notify the public when a law enforcement officer is missing, seriously injured or killed in the line of duty, or when there is a credible threat to that law enforcement, that, that law enforcement officer's life. And EAS are going to go into place by January of next year. We will go into place by July of next year. And, and a little bit of background I think might be helpful here to understand the value of Blue Alerts. Uh, the Blue Alert Act was named after two, uh, Wen Jin Liu and, uh, and Ramos were Act, was, was named after two New York City police officers who were murdered uh, in their police car by a guy who had drove up from Baltimore to New York City with the stated intention to kill the cops. And he had put this out on social media. It took him four hours to drive to New York. There was a lot of time to notify the public because they know what the car, they really knew everything about this guy. But because there was no efficient way of warning the public or efficient way of having interstate law enforcement notify each other, um, the folks in New York didn't know what was going to happen until it was too late. Now, there's no indication that what happened in that instance would have been prevented by a blue alert, but it certainly brought to Congress's attention and to our attention the need for law enforcement to, inf to inform each other and also to the public in these kinds of situations. So let's go to wireless emergency alerts. Before we talk about wireless emergency alerts or WIA, uh, just be aware that these slides will be available after the, uh, after the presentation today. So that way you can get the URLs what not, and ask new and better questions. Uh, we are rules, again, 47 CFR 10.1 at sequence. This uh, was established pursuant to a particular congressional act called the Warning Alert and Response Network Act. Uh, and under the act, it said that it was voluntary on the part of wireless providers. They don't have to do this. If they do it, however, they have to deliver the warnings and the alerts uh, according to the rules. It uses the IPOS architecture, which we looked at earlier. It's all written in the common alerting protocols. It's a lot of data comes out in these alerts. And unlike EAS that has specific codes for each separate alert, WIAs are break down into three categories. Presidential, I think is obvious. Ambers, which are your child abduction alert. And imminent threat. And an imminent threat uh, is something that you'd have to study a little bit more in detail, but what it means in simple terms is that it's an event that is very serious, that is observable, and is going to be happening imminently. So, for example, a tornado is an imminent threat. A hurricane that might be three or four days out uh, is serious, but it's not imminent. Whereas if you have a hurricane that's hitting the shore and you have storm surge warnings, those are imminent. Another really good example of an imminent threat are flash floods uh, that can happen in national forests or, or wherever. So learning how to determine what is an imminent threat is a big part of the training for alert initiators at the state, local, tribal, territorial level. Very simple diagram of WIA. This shows how the diagram we looked at earlier it makes it much clearer. Federal agencies, local emergency operations centers, state emergency operations centers are your trusted source. Your alert aggregator, gateway, and CMSP gateway infrastructure is your commercial delivery infrastructure. And that mobile device is the public. 
Now, one thing, let me just skip ahead one slide. Yeah, one thing about WIA that's very cool is that WIA is a geo-targeted <coughs> local alert. It is not a phone call. So if it only works when you are in the area of the alert, and while the commission doesn't mandate a particular technology, what the carriers pretty much mostly use is something called cell broadcasting that turns your phone into a little radio receiver and turns those cell towers into broadcast towers. And the cell towers that, let's say, surround the area where the bad thing is happening will be broadcasting the alert. So if you happen to be in there when the alert is issued, if you happen to drive within the perimeter of that area, you will get the alert. And you'll get a big, loud noise. You may have already heard this. And you'll get a 90-character text on your phone. This is terrific because, for example, if, if you're from New York City, but you happen to be in Oklahoma during an a earthquake or during a tornado, I mean, I'm sorry, you'll get that alert, okay? If you're in, in Florida during a hurricane and the alert comes through that for uh, the storm surge, you will get that. However, if you're from Miami and you happen to be in New York when the hurricane's hit Miami, the alert's not relevant to you, so you don't get it. The commission is doing a number of, has continued since WIA was launched in 2012, to continue to improve WIA because it has proven to be already a life and property saving service. Uh, there have been thousands of WIAs issued. Uh, Amber Alerts have been incredibly successful. Hundreds of kids have been, uh, have, have been found uh, due to these WIA Amber Alerts. Uh, same thing with tornadoes, any number of lives saved. One of the issues with WIA is that we've, we're tightening, the commission is tightening and tightening the area where the WIAs would go off to have it more clearly reflect the area affected. So whereas when WIA were, were launched in 2012, the technology was such that, that um, uh, it could only act for a county. Well, there'd be plenty of people in that county, particularly in the west of the Mississippi, who were not affected by the alert, who were not affected by the incident, but would nonetheless get the alert. It's not great to have a system where you're getting essentially cry wolf alerts to people. So what the Commission has done over the last number of years is go through a series of rulemakings to narrow this down. Currently, uh, carriers are required to <coughs> deliver an alert within an area that best approximates the area to be alerted, much smaller than a county. But by the time of November 2019, the wireless carriers will be required to exactly match the area within one-tenth of a mile. So we're very much looking forward to that. Alert content similarly improved. Uh, the technology was such in 2012, you could not have an active hyperlink to link you to a website or a phone, a phone, and you were limited to 90 characters. That is changing. As of today, national wireless providers must, re must support active hyperlinks. Again, it's up to the alert initiator to provide the hyperlink. But if it's received, but the network will support it and the carriers will support it. I'll give you a really good example of that. We had a, there were a series of wildfires in northern and southern California. Uh, the end of last year, beginning of this year. Uh, by the time the latter fires happened in Ventura County uh, in December, these rules had gone into effect for national carriers. And the folks who were initiating the wireless emergency alerts in Ventura were able to include a very short URL that guided recipients of the alert to areas where they were able to get emergency supplies and go to evacuation centers. It's tremendously helpful, allows these alerts to communicate a whole lot more information than you can fit into the text. We're very excited about that. Uh, similarly, message length by May of 1 of 2019 will increase from 90 to 360 characters, much more effective messages. And also participating wireless providers must support Spanish language alerts. So I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail about IPAWS and the Common Alerting Protocol, but alert initiators initiating an alert can alert them, can initiate them in multiple languages. And all of those files will travel through the internet to the handset that would be programmed to say, oh, this guy wants the Spanish one. Pull that out and deliver that to the member of the public. So this has worked very well in the uh, EAS context over the last few years. We're very excited about seeing it happen in the, um, in the uh, WIA context by May of 2019. Also, testing, there'll be rules in place to allow WIA end-to-end -end testing, testing to the public in May 1st of 2019. 
but over the last few months the commission has also granted waivers to a number of uh, of, of localities uh, most recently Vail Colorado Twin Cities Minnesota uh, there's one recently granted in Missouri back in April there was a 20 jurisdiction test done in the National Capital Region of Washington to just determine how well we uh, worked how well it was received by the public how narrow we were able to see it geo-targeted. So we are working very close, and all of those, by the way, all of those waivers were initiated by state, local, government entities saying, we want to make sure we have worked within our community. Please allow us to conduct a test. We will conduct certain outreach to make sure that people know it's only a test. And the commission and the wireless carriers have been very responsive to those. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about testing. Uh, the Commission has done nationwide tests of the emergency alert system first in 2011 and then most recently in September of 2016 and September of 2017. Uh, the te most recent test in September of 2017 was, as the other ones have been done, was done by uh, FEMA in coordination with the FCC and the National Weather Service, initiating the test that would then be carried by all of the EAS participants around the country. So the idea of the test was to test the reliability of the, of the EAS and make sure that IPAWS was operating the way it's supposed to. And it also, you know, as tests do, allow us at the Commission to evaluate improvements by EAS participants. Uh, there are a lot of EAS participants. There are 21,000 licensed broadcasters in the United States, approximately and about another 5,000 pieces of cable equipment in the United States. Each one of these has a separate obligation to deliver EAS to the public. So in order to, to herd these cats, what the Commission did a few years ago was develop a database called the EAS Test Reporting System by which all of these entities must report their status. Think of that slide a few slides ago. Where do they fit within that hierarchy? Who do they monitor? Where are they located within a state? They have to give us that information and that information about how, whether they received the test, whether they transmitted it, and particular problems that they may have had in, in doing either of those, uh, either, either, either of those. So we are now really being able to see how well EAS works on a national level. And actually it's been working quite, quite, quite well. We released, the, the commission uh, released, the Bureau released its report on, in April of 2018. And overall the system works well, but as you want from any test, you can see what the technical issues for improvement are. And one of the things is we talked a little bit before about how you get more and better information over iPods than you do over the broadcast. Broadcast should be your redundant, not so much a backup, but, but something that would not necessarily be the first choice. Is how, can, how can we work with these broadcasters to make sure that they deliver the high bandwidth information first? How can we work with these folks to ensure that they uh, uh, address people the needs with disabilities. And I'll, I'll talk about that just a little bit uh, in, a, in, a, in a second. Uh, and, and how other EAS participant practices might impede the full accessibility of the test. These alerts need to reach the public. That means all of the public. The Commission has very specific rules to make sure that uh, alerts are accessible to all people. Uh, including people with disabilities. And so, for example, uh, the, uh, an EAS is, has, has an audio and a, uh, a text crawl in it, if you're watching your TV. We have very specific rules about how that crawl can't be too quick. The font has to be readable. It has to run through that alert at least twice. Similarly with the audio, the audio has to be accessible. It has to be uh, clear. It has to be understandable. And also for the text bit, uh, uh, EAS text alerts, the text portion of the EAS alert is separate from closed captioning. That has to run across the top of the screen so it doesn't interfere with the closed caption. So a fully accessible EAS test or alert would have a, a crawl that would automatically go across the top. And then if you had your closed captioning enabled on your, on your television, would run the text across the bottom as well. Um, so over the next year, uh, the, uh, uh, the Public Service Homeland Security Bureau 
will encourage EAS participants to adopt best practice for, for, the, for the delivery of accessible alerts, to keep up their EAS equipment, and to run whatever little software patch they might need to run to make sure that they can get that iPause-based EAS alert before defaulting to the broadcast one. The Commission also will continue to work with SECCs, which we do, and EAS equipment manufacturers to reach out to EAS participants to encourage them to update their EAS equipment software to ensure successful participation in alerts and tests. Why false alert? I think everybody in the United States probably on January, in January, uh, I guess it was around 16th or so, became aware that there was a, uh, a false ballistic missile alert using EAS in way, and we have sent out uh, in, in Hawaii. And, and the emergency management uh, agency in Hawaii was you know, very committed to testing, very committed to doing the right thing and making sure their systems work. Uh, uh, this was something that, that, that happened. The commission uh, investigated it released a report with, with recommendations to guard against it, that even with the best of intentions, uh, a, a state agency, can, can something like this can, can happen. So here are some of the recommendations, and, and they're true for Hawaii, but they're really generally applicable to any state agency that wants to become really highly involved in, in alerting the U.S. public. You need to have redundant and effective lines with communi of communication with your key stakeholders. I spoke earlier about some of whom these key stakeholders are. You're a key stakeholder, obviously, the state local city government. That state broadcast association is a key stakeholder. That SECC is a key stakeholder. That area, uh, WIA, you know, a National Weather Service meteorologist is a key stakeholder. These are all local guys. Uh, there will also be local representation by your cable provider and by your wireless providers. But unless you have a very regional wireless providers, these are going to be local representatives of rather large national companies. So you need to be in touch with them, but the folks who have their boots on the ground right along with yours are going to be your broadcasters and that National Weather Service. Uh, conduct regular internal tests. This is, you know, using a test bed. So FEMA's Integrated Public and Warning System Test Lab is a terrific test bed. This is what they're there to do, is to help state and local city government learn how to use these systems effectively. It's a really good online system. The URL is, is, is in these slides. Click it, check it out, give them a call. Have more than one credentialed person validate the message content so that if, if one person really, with all good intentions, thinks it's an actual alert, the other person will say, no, no, that's a test. Let's make sure we send out the test message. Make sure your upgrades to alert software. And you know, any of these any of these systems, if you use the vendors to get into IPAWS, they all run regular software patches. EAS participants equipment all runs regular has regular software patches. It's basic security to run these patches, patches on a, a regular basis. Also develop standard operating procedures for responding to false alerts. So for example, if you sent the false alert over the emergency alert system in WIA, you send the correction over emergency alert system at WIA. You'd have also your internal procedures as to knowing what you need to do and not wondering whether you have to ask for permission. This is the kind of stuff you work on and you practice before the event. Consult with SECs on a regular basis, at least annually, to ensure that the state plan information is up to date, EAS procedures, initiation and cancellation of alerts, that you, as the folks who would be initiating these alerts, or your, your, your designees would be initiating these alerts, have a mutual understanding with the folks that are going to be delivering. Because whether you use the, the local distribution system or use iPaws, those broadcasters who are going to be delivering the alerts in your area are local. Okay, and, and are eager to work with you to make sure that the correct information gets to the public. After the Hawaii report, the Bureau, uh, Public Safety Bureau, hosted a public roundtable with stakeholders to share lessons learned and promote a continued dialogue. Uh, and just among the recommendations and major takeaways was to, again, engage in proficiency training, adopt best practices for alerts and tests, build those local relationships, uh, Stakeholders, state emergency managers, SECs should meet on a regular basis. Um, 
State emergency personnel responsible for initiating alerts should take the training. I mean, in some cases, they have to take the training in order to get authorized. But, you know, getting that initial authorization is only the first step. What you want to do is you want to be able to practice and train so that this can be an automatic reflex. You don't wonder what you have to do in the case of an emergency. Uh, the roundtable was a pretty much a whole afternoon long event. It had everybody from FEMA to the FCC to the National Weather Service to emergency managers from a number of different states, from broadcasters from a number of different states. Uh, I highly recommend you watch it. Uh, and as you can see, the archived webcast of the roundtable, yeah, the link to it is right there. So, the Commission and the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau will continue to reach out to government and industry stakeholders to promote best practices. We are planning a webinar with FEMA uh, that I think could be quite pertinent to your needs for July 2018 is the current tentative date. Uh, keep your eyes open for a, a public notice on that. And I know the folks here in the FCC's Intergovernmental Affairs Group will probably uh, forward any public notice to you. And thank you. Happy to, happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Uh, that was a great presentation. And we do have uh, some questions. And uh, I'll start off with one here from um, Utah Division of Emergency Management. What scenario would you envision the president uh, would actually issue a presidential alert? You know, that's never occurred. And that's a common question we get. And, 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 and people usually also say, well, why wasn't it done during 9-11? And the reason it wasn't done during 9-11 is because CNN and ABC and CBS and all the cable stations still worked. And so it, uh, there was effective means for the president to reach, as George Bush did at the time, to reach the public. The, the uh, genesis of the presidential alert goes all the way back to the 1950s, to Conrad, and during the early days of the Cold War, where the EAS and its predecessor systems, like the emergency broadcast system, were developed to give the president a way of getting to the public in the case of nuclear war. So I think the idea, at least to date, has been that you would have such a serious situation that other communications infrastructure was not available. And you were depending upon the broadcast infrastructure of a very, very specific subset of the broadcast infrastructure, largely radio uh, and some television, to get through to the American public. Uh, because the way EAS works now is that all you would be get you would just get a voice to let you know that constitutional government is still in place. And we just hope we've designed the system to work without a hitch, but we really hope that we never have to use it. Thank you. Next question is from Solano County, and uh, not sure if you can answer this one. Uh, they may know more about the topic than you. Has the internet connection to the iPause lab been fixed for testing? I, my understanding is that it works right now. I mean, we can uh, if you click on the link and you get in touch with the folks in the iPause division, they should be able to set you up. But but I, I'm not aware of anything that's, that's wrong with the link to the lab. Thank you. Um, Next is from New Hampshire Department of Safety, Division of Emergency Services and Communications. Is the state required to send the alert out over both the internet and over the air, or can it choose either? You know, uh, that, that, thank you for that question, because uh, everybody gets very excited about these new systems and about these new technologies, and they think, you know, and I just go back to the old campfire girl things, of, you know, make new friends but keep the old because these systems are both designed to work. You absolutely can just send it out over iPods. Uh, but that would really be to the detriment of, of a system that, that works. And uh, 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 we've found in certain cases that, that um, it's really necessary to have that, that link and uh, to be able to get to the local, uh, the local distribution system. But yeah, if, if you want to, you can do either. But we really recommend you do both, because they are complementary. Thank you. Next is from um, Iowa Department of Homeland Security and Emergency <coughs> Management. Uh, a couple questions. If a person is in an area where there are no cell phone towers, where a warning area has been identified and a message sent to Polygon area, will they get the message? Uh, I, not likely. 
I, I think at this point, the way the systems work, and again, that is something where I would want to check with the carrier in, in your area uh, to find out how they've done this, because there are a lot of ways that the towers can, 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 can issue these alerts. And again, these are not high bandwidth alerts. These are really low bandwidth alerts. So you could be really far from a cell tower, like let's say in a national forest, and maybe only getting a bar, and you could be able to get that alert. Okay, so um, the, uh, uh, I, I think it's really very carrier carrier specific, but you do need to have some level of connectivity. Um, Follow-up question, do alerters uh, or trusted sources need to know where cell phone towers are located, and will Verizon towers send the alert to AT&T customers okay. and vice versa? Okay. Great questions. And, and the short answer is no and yes. Okay. You don't have to know where they are. Um, it, it, you do need to, if you're, I mean, the National Weather Service will draw a polygon for tornado alert, for example. Uh, any of you might draw a polygon uh, or, or do something with zip codes or send it out to county X or county Y. Uh, you don't need to know where those towers are located. That's up to the carriers who are required to deliver the alert within the area specified by the alert initiator. And again, these, there is full uh, 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 comedy among these carriers. So if you're a Verizon customer and you're going through an AT&T area, you'll get the alert and vice versa. Thanks. Uh, next uh, is from Peoria, Arizona. In regards to WEA messages supporting Spanish, will it offer the ability to translate an English message into that Spanish message? You know, I I think it's again. This isn't do. This isn't um, required uh, until next May. So we're not exactly sure. I think this will be very carrier specific. I think the idea is that the alert will go out over iPause with that option in it, that you'd have a Spanish language file and, a, uh, and an English language file, and then it's somewhere in the network and the handset would be delivered appropriately. I think one of the, it's not really part of this presentation, but delivering alerts to people who do not speak English is a big issue for the commission, uh, as, I'm, as I'm sure any number of you out there would agree that you want to make sure that that uh, your citizens who are not English speakers should be alerted. Obviously, uh, um, one of the things that we found is that the is that the best way to do it under current technology is that that multilingual alert is initiated from the source. So we know, for example, in, in Florida and in Texas, that alerts are initiated in English and Spanish. We know that in the Twin Cities, they've had a program where alerts would be initiated in English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong to, to address community needs. Uh, this is the best way of ensuring that an accurate alert is delivered to the public. When the responsibility is put on the, the entity at the edge, you know, the broadcaster, cell phone provider, to translate it, uh, you run into issues of liability, you run into issues of latency, because it takes time to translate, you run into issues of accuracy. And so traditionally, the Commission has not imposed that obligation on the, on the edge. It, 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 what we have done is ensure that when that alert is issued in multiple languages, that the systems are capable of delivering it in multiple languages. Thanks. Uh, next question is from Ohio Department of Public Safety. Will the FCC provide more guidance on how approved EAS codes are to be used? Uh, you know, I, I, I understand what, what you're asking, but we've usually deferred to the localities on that because certainly between, I pick, pick one at random, you know, Oklahoma, uh, tornado alerts. I would think that the state government, state emergency management agencies, and the local broadcasters and, and, and wireless carriers there would be far better able to determine their local needs than, uh, than having something that would be imposed from the top by the FCC. So the way the Commission has, has, has traditionally structured things like state plans is that we set up systems that allow for clear communication among the local stakeholders, but we're not going to impose a particular solution on those stakeholders. Thank you. Next one is from the uh, Southeast Texas Regional Planning Commission. And the 
has a question about what constitutes an emergency. Where can a local jurisdiction find the statute that specifies what does and does not constitute an emergency per the FCC? Would that be 47 CFR 11.1? We're not just asking about WEA, but also what the FCC considers an emergency for use by emergency management coordinators when sending their local messages, which may or may not include iPods. Got it. If you take a look at EAS uh, 11.31, okay, you will see, and I forget which subsection it is, uh, but you will see in there a listing of codes, of event codes, and those event codes will give the entire list of the kind of events that you can use to trigger an emergency alert system alert. Tornadoes, child abduction, hurricane high wind warnings, flash floods, earthquakes, uh, come next January, blue alerts, uh, uh, any number of things. Each one of those is authorized to be used within the EAS as, uh, as, as, as an actual emergency alert. And there are a couple of catch-alls, you know, civil emergency, a civil defense, in case you have something that is, is different uh, and doesn't fit into a clear category. But those are very specific guidelines. The point I was making earlier about WIA and imminent threat is that um, that does really put quite a bit of, of, of um, responsibility and discretion on the alert manager to determine what qualifies as, a, as an imminent threat. But I would, I would guide you to part 10 to take a look at the elements of, of, uh, of, um, of severity and imminence and urgency that are required for that. I will say on a practical basis, a lot of people use the codes, use the EAS codes to determine whether they're going to send out a WIA. Um, there are things that don't fit into that, okay? Uh, but um, I think that answered the question. I hope so. Okay. But, well, just to be clear, though, it's 47 CFR 11.31? Yes, you got 47 uh, CFR 11.31, and you also have uh, uh, 47 CFR 10. Uh, point whatever uh, that will tell you. And those, if you go on the commission's website, go on FCC.gov and open the, um, uh, click on bureaus and offices, I think you'll see that at the top of the screen, and go to the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, you will see links to EAS, you will see links to wireless emergency alerts, and on both of those pages are links to the appropriate rules. All right, here's another one from the Utah Division of Emergency Management. How hard is it to get a waiver to do a live end-to-end -end WEAA test, similar to what the National Capital Region did recently? Uh, Who I do would, we contact for that waiver? I, I would, what I would take a look at that, I can't, you know, predict what would happen in your particular instance. What I would suggest you do is take a look at what was filed. Go, go take a look at, at the request that the National Capital Region made. And if you and again, that's on the that's on the commission's website. And take a look at the order, and then I think you can see uh, what what the criteria are and, and what the decision making elements are. Uh, next one, we have a few from um, the Oregon uh, Office of Emergency Management uh, Military Deployment. One that a lot of people have been asking, which I'll answer, is uh, where can people get a copy of your PowerPoint? and it will be made available on the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs uh, webpage within the next few days, uh, both with the slides and the full audio, uh, so you can listen to this again, or someone you know that you think might be interested who wasn't able to uh, be here today can listen. Uh, next, they ask, uh, does the FCC have a list of who has not opted into the system? I believe that the FCC maintains an open docket. You're, if you're talking about the wireless emergency alerts, uh, uh, I think that the FCC maintains an open docket of folks who, of the entities that, uh, that have opted in or not. But I will tell you that under the WARN Act, uh, wireless providers may opt in in full or in part. It's allowed under the statute. And what that means is that uh, you know, wireless carrier X may provide WIA within some, but not all of its uh, area, uh, and it may provide WIA on some, but not all of its available handsets. And that's 
that's that's the law right now. But I think on a practical basis, what you're going to see is that the national carriers all participate, and the vast majority of handsets right now are weak capable. Uh, next question uh, related, they ask, does the FCC have a way to track who has received an alert sent out to the system? Really interesting question. And, and one of the big issues, I'm going to work my way around to that answer. Uh, one of the first questions that we were always asked when we launched is, do they know where I am? I don't want to be tracked. I mean, that's still on our public information page. And the short answer to that is no. I mean, no more than I know where you are if, 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 if you know, you're listening to your car radio. Um, so the short answer is right now, uh, unless somebody gets back to us, or in the case of some of these weird tests where there was a, a survey and people got back to us as to whether or not they got their test, that information is, is not generated currently uh, by the end user when uh, OEA is sent out. Uh, next question is from Division of Emergency Communications Networks in Minnesota. Uh, question about the EAS test reporting system. Can the data be shared with SECCs or state planners? Yeah, we're working on that one. The thing is, we, we, we've shared data in the aggregate because the individual filings are presumptively confidential. Uh, but we have been sharing this in the aggregate with SECs after the last couple of tests. Next one, it goes to the uh, Spanish language again uh, on WEA. When will there be more information coming out on how it is going to work so it can be incorporated into our emergency communication plan? I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I'm going to have to check with the carriers on that. They know what their deadline is, and um, I think we'll be following up with them to get some ideas, but I don't have anything right now. I mean, certainly there'll be notice, obviously, but I just don't have anything to tell you right this second. Uh, Next question, uh, if I want to start sending alerts, what's my next step? How do I sign up to get trained? Uh, click onto, um, I, I would get onto that FEMA website. And if you need further information, we can get it to you. But I would start with, I would start with, uh, with getting on, there's, uh, if you click on that FEMA website, it has quite explicit instructions of how to get authorized. So that would be where you begin. And uh, I'll ask a question I asked the other day of you, Greg. So uh, with the wireless alerts, if my phone is off or in airplane mode, will I get the alert when, when it first comes out? Will I get it at all later when I turn on my phone? Um, you have to be connected to the network to get the alert. Now, that doesn't mean if you're like, let's say, you have a system where you do Wi-Fi calling. Um, you are still, you still have a backdoor to the network even if you're doing Wi-Fi calling. So if you're doing Wi-Fi calling and you have bars, you'll get the alert. Um, if your phone is off, if you have opted out of receiving alerts, which you may do, you can opt out of all of them with the presidential alert. And those are specific toggles that you'll see in your settings on your handset. Um, if you're out of range of the alert, you're not going to get it. If the alert, if you're, to answer the second part of that question, it really kind of depends upon the timing. If that alert is, if the, you know, the alerts are good for a certain period of time. Uh, if, if that alert, if let's say you have your, for whatever reason, you have something muted or whatever, and, that, and, you, and you're in the area where that alert is active, and, and then you turn your phone on, if the alert's still active, you get the alert. If you, uh, so, so there would be some circumstances where you would get it after. Um. How geographically accurate are wireless alerts? When will they be more targeted? Right now, okay, initially 2012, county. Uh, as of last year, I think 2016 or so, I forget the exact date, it had to be best approximates. So you had to do your best way to, 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 to duplicate the polygon. And you can think of a polygon as being the path of a tornado or, or maybe when you're going after some uh, an amber alert, you know, the guy's going up a particular highway, you, you, you have a path for that. Um, uh, as of November 2019, they have to match the polygon almost exactly with only one tenth of one mile overage. So that will be the, uh, that's when it's going to be super rapid. So, so looking for, going through the questions here. Are 
are the state emergency communications committees government organizations? Is it necessary to join them? How do I find the one for my state? Okay. Great question. They are not government organizations. They are generally volunteer, volunteer organizations. Uh, very often they're going to be headed by the uh, State Broadcast Association. Uh, often we also find out that state emergency managers may be on the SECC, but the SECC is not itself a government entity. What you do to get it is, again, go, what I said before, go to the FCC.gov, go to the um, uh, Homeland Security, uh, you know, Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau, go through to Policy and Licensing Bureau, go to EAS, and uh, you will see them. We have a list of state plans and the SECCs for all the states. And um, it's really up to the SECC and you as to whether you need to be a member, uh, but it might be just the right thing for you. We're getting close to our, our hour limit. Uh, you, you, may have you, may, you may have covered this, but it doesn't hurt uh, being repeated. Do consumers receive wireless alerts automatically? Do they opt in, opt out? Okay. You will receive emergency alerts. We are emergency alerts, alerts automatically. Individual consumers have the opportunity to opt out of them. They can opt out of AMBERS, and you can opt out of the imminent threat alerts. And again, there'll be a toggle in your handset settings. You may not opt out of presidential alerts. And last question, when can we test WEA without getting a waiver? Uh, May of 2019. And just to give you a little bit of information, under that scenario, the public can opt would opt in to receiving the test alert. They wouldn't necessarily have to get the test alert if they didn't want to. Well, thanks, Greg. I think that was very informative, and I hope uh, our audience out there uh, found value in it. Uh, if you out there have other topics you think a webinar would be uh, suitable for, for um, state and local government officials, uh, shoot us an email to iga at fcc.gov, and we'll put it in the hopper. Uh, if you've got any other questions uh, for us about uh, Greg's presentation, or just generally for the FCC, uh, you can send uh, them to that email address and uh, we will try and get you uh, to the right person uh, to get your question uh, answered. Uh, Greg, you have anything else you want to add before we uh, say goodbye? No, no, this was a real pleasure. Uh, thanks, Rich, and everybody for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, conduct this webinar. Uh, I, I think if you take a look at some of the documents we've been releasing recently, that, like that Hawaii report and other, 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 other reports we've been sending out, the relationship of the state local government to making sure that citizens get alerts is is key you guys are an essential essential stakeholders so i was really happy to be able to do this presentation today and yeah as rich said if you have any more questions just please send them in and we'll get back to you all right thanks very much and goodbye to everybody uh, until next time <laughs>